Hello everybody, Dr. John Waterhouse here, and I wanna to talk today about brachial plexus injuries. Now this video is gonna be a little longer than normal just because there's so much content to get through. It's probably gonna be about a 15 minute video. So I just wanna give you the heads up on that and let's get into it. So last week, one of our members, Karen from the UK, contacted me about two cases that she has of brachial plexus injury. And both of these cases are on a one and one and a half year post injury patient that the owners don't want to amputate the affected limb. And so Karen was asking me what other options could she incorporate into her rehabilitation modalities to help treat these patients. And this got me thinking because a lot of people over the years have asked me questions about brachial plexus injuries. And would I do a webinar on those? And yes, we will get to that. But I thought, well, let's do a quick summation of what brachial plexus injuries are over the next couple of minutes. So we need to think about anatomy. And the anatomy of the dog is that their forelimb is attached to their body through muscle and sinew. There's actually no bony attachment like a shoulder joint that we have. They are just pretty much stuck. The forelimb is stuck onto the trunk. So that means that any injuries where there's tearing away of the limb from the trunk causes tearing or, or stretching of the nerves, sinews, muscles, and ligaments. And so a brachial plexus avulsion is where we have some type of trauma that tears the limb away from the trunk and we get stretching and tearing of those nerves. And so this is really important when we're thinking about anatomy, how innovation of that front limb happens and where the nerves come off the spinal cord to innovate the front limb. So typically avulsions of the brachial plexus can be classified in three areas. So number one is cranial avulsions, and this usually happens between C6 to C7. And usually we don't see any neurological or clinical signs, but this is also very rare. And so with this type, it's just a strain at the top end, so really cranially of where the nerves come out that innervate the forelimb, and we see very few clinical signs. So number two we have is caudal avulsion. This is usually from C8 through to T2, and this is more common of what we see. And so this can be everything from mild through to severe neurological um, deficits. So we have dragging of the paw, not being able to flex or extend, um, and loss of sensory pain and also deep pain. And then the third that really I call it the catastrophic is complete rupture or avulsion of all um, spinal nerves from C6 through to T2. And in this, we then have neurological um, Horner's syndrome. So we have a dropping of the upper eyelid. We'll have showing of the third eyelid and also we'll have um, compression or of the pupil. And when we see this, this is, I classify as catastrophic, and this comes as, as the third, and it's complete avulsion of the brachial plexus nerves. So let's talk about classic clinical signs. So clinical signs for most common is, as we've said, from C8 to T2, um, and we'll then have deficits. They'll be coming in, they'll be dragging their limb. They might actually have the limb um, flexed, um, but the paw is um, flopping with no innovation. Um, they may have some deep pain sensation. They may have some sensory sensation on the radial nerve. So the radial nerve innervates the front paw and the ulna comes down behind. So it's very important we see. So they may have some sensation. And so these have, if there's deep pain or some type of um, sensory um, stimulation, um, we have a chance. So with our clinical signs, it all depends, as we just talked about, the three main common areas, or I call it three ways that they can evolve. So too do we have clinical signs that go with those three evolution categories. And it depends which category we're in to what the clinical signs are. So as I said, with a cranial evolution, very few clinical signs that we see. 
With a caudal avulsion, the most common avulsion, we then see they'll come in dragging their paw. Um, or they might have the paw flexed, but the, or the elbow flexed, but the paw is hanging. Or they may have no deep pain sensation at all, or some sensory sensation around the radial nerve that is at the front, or the ulnar nerve that comes through underneath. Or they may then have the third that's a catastrophic or complete avulsion. They then have neurological horn and sign to go along with um, a flaccid paw that now is usually dragging without any flexion in the elbow or any deep pain sensation. So when we see one of these patients, how do we diagnose this? And this comes through a full neurological workup. And so the patient is conscious and we go through and we do all the 12 cranial nerves and then we work through uh, the, the limb doing nerve sensation. So this is pin testing, um, deep pain, withdrawal, noxious stimulus, all those different exercises or neurological examinations to try and work out which nerves may still be available, may be patent and which nerves aren't. And then we create a checklist. And with that checklist, you can pretty much pinpoint how and which nerves are still available. If you have access to electromyography, EMG, then you can also do testing to see which nerves are still firing, how much nerve conduction is still available. Most people don't have access to that. EMG is really great for doing it over a couple of days to weeks to see if there are improvements or not. And that's where the real power of that diagnostic modality comes in. So we've now done a diagnostic workup. We now know what's going on. So what are the prognoses and what are things that we need to be looking for and with our patients? So usually there's no big change in the first seven to 10 days because we have such swelling in the area. We're thinking of cranial swelling, nerve swelling. And so this takes seven to 10 days to resolve. So in this period is a period where we can actually see improvement or no improvement and then improvement at seven and 10 days when we get resolution of swelling. We may, the next big hallmark is four to six weeks. And at four to six weeks, we can see another improvement period because we now have reversal of local nerve swelling and regeneration. And so with that nerve damage, we're now having remyelination. And if things are going to be coming back, they'll be coming back at this four to six week period. And so when we talk about our three classes of nerve damage, our caudal avulsions, we have really good prognosis with these guys because we very rarely see any or only slight uh, clinical signs with this type of avulsion. With our caudal avulsions, and this is the most common, this can be severe to actually we get uh, resolution. And this is where I call it the Joys or tears come with this disease, the frustration or the heroes, because we get some patients will resolve and do really well and come out of this with full neural or just slight neurological deficits, and then other patients don't. And this is where we really need to give them that four to six week period to test them. Actually, I, I talk to my clients about giving six months. And so and in the literature and most places, if your amputation is going to be a surgical option, it's usually around the six month period is where amputation, because we've tried everything, we've done everything. And so number three is then complete avulsion. And that's where everything from C6 all through T2 has been totally ripped out of the spinal column. And then our third, the complete avulsion from where we have all the spinal nerve roots are torn out of the spinal column from C6 all the way through to T2. They now have Horner's syndrome. These have the most guarded prognosis of the three types of avulsion that happen with brachial plexus. And usually when we see neurological components of Horner syndrome with the flaccid, no deep pain, these then are a, uh, a surgical candidates for emergency amputation. And we very rarely see a good return to function from these patients. I won't say we never, and I never give up on these patients, but these more are the patients when we're gonna talk about treatment that we get into problems. 
So let's talk about treatment options. And we know with the caudal avulsion patients, they really don't need that much treatment unless they've got some neurological deficits going on and then we can get them into rehabilitation. But with most of these guys, we don't see it. We see it or pick it up with MRI or CT scans, but we don't see clinical signs with these guys. With our most common, the caudal avulsion patients, we need to now look at putting a collar on them if they've lost deep pain sensation. They may need splinting. They may need some type of surgery, so tendon transposition or nerve transposition. And these are surgical procedures that can actually reattach the nerves, reattach or lengthen the tendons or shorten the tendons to help rebuild and give some function back to the limb in these guys. And then we look at our complete avulsion patients, our number third category patients. And so these guys, really you can try tendon transposition, and nerve transposition, but usually it fails because with complete tearing of the nerves off the, or the nerve roots off the spinal cord, there's very little that can be reattached is in nerves. And so people have tried and we can get success, but these Patients we've talked about have more guarded prognosis. And then at the end, there's amputation. So people are saying, well, what can we do for these guys rehabilitation wise? And what modalities should we be incorporating into our rehabilitation strategy? And really it's most important, I break it down into three phases. I love threes. So three phases acutely, that first seven to 10 days. Then from 10 days to the four week to the six week period, and then after the six weeks to the six month period. And then in Karen's situation, what do we do if we're seeing a patient a year after an injury and they're now presenting to us? So let's talk about the first seven to 10 days. We wanna be doing everything we can to help with inflammation, to getting that inflammation down. So laser, electromagnetic field therapy, underwater treadmill, electroacupuncture, acupuncture, neuroelectrical muscular stimulation, everything. We want to throw the kitchen the sink at these guys because they are a medical emergency. And if we can do something to help with inflammation in that first seven to 10 days, we can actually, this is the time that we can make real great gains with these patients for a longer period of time to help res resolve neurological issues. After the seven to 10 days, now we're moving into where these guys can be a surgical candidate if we're going to do any type of surgery. But still for that first four weeks, I am throwing everything at these guys. So laser, electromagnetic field therapy, underwater treadmill, because we can help remyelinate in, their, in the water, actually placing their pores doing everything that they can to remyelinate those nerves if those nerves are there. But also if they're not and they've got deficits, they can come back. So I'm in there manually placing their feet for them, trying to remyelinate their brain about how to use that function. Electroacupuncture, they've talked about. Neuromuscular electrical stimulation, try and keep muscle mass, keep those neurons firing because we see atrophy and we don't want atrophy because we now then get contracture. And this is also common to see because we will be splinting these guys or putting an e-collar on them to prevent them being able to do self-trauma. And if they do self-trauma to themselves because they've lost deep pain sensation and they gnaw themselves, and I've seen some horrific injuries, now these are non-salvaged procedures or injuries and they need to go to amputation because it's a medical emergency. So we wanna do everything we can to protect that limb from trauma, but also dragging. And I've seen horrible wounds because they're dragging the limb around the house. They can't feel it. And we get now lesions and infections and things like that. And once we get those, now they're medical emergency again, and they may need to go for amputation. So we want to splint them, put them in bandages, casts, but also an e-collar on our patients so they don't do self-trauma. But when they're in a splint, we know we get contracture. So we may need to bring in soft tissue ultrasound to warm up that scar tissue, contraction, to then use manual therapy to work it out. So manual therapy is really important in this time. From six weeks on to six months, now we're getting into the windows where 
unless we're seeing changes, the long-term prognosis is now becoming poor. But if I still have innovation, if they're still able to flex that elbow and plant their paw a little bit, I don't give up on these guys and they're going to intensive rehab and I still keep going with these guys with the intensive rehab. And then after the six month period, now we're getting into more, if the clients don't want amputation, we can then put them into brace. And there's great companies or ortho pets or hero dogs that do incredible braces that can help our patients put them into braces that now support, lock out that limb and they have a, I call it a peg leg, but now they have a functional limb that they can support weight on and move around if amputation isn't on the cards. If our clients are amenable to amputation, now this is the point where we need to have those big conversations because the dogs do very well with amputation. But as I said, amputation is the I, the last resort, I try and do everything before then. But we need to remember these are merit medical emergencies and we need to treat them like medical emergencies. And if they get trauma, if they do self mutilization if they get any other type of fracture or they hurt that limb, now we need to tell and give realistic guidance to our clients that the pet may need to go for medical emergency amputation. In Karen's case, after a year when no rehabilitation has been done, her patients came in, they had contracture, one has no feeling, one can slightly flex the elbow a bit and do a little bit of planting. Um, they're two different cases. Um, both, I said, would recommend from a brace because now we've got contracture. Work on that contracture, ultrasound out, heat therapy, try and get the contractures out is the main thing, and then work in hydrotherapy to try and get some movement going back in, but both potentially would be candidates for braces. So hopefully that's answered the question. Um, we've gone over the usual, I like to keep these about 10 minutes, but there's a lot to go through. I'm also gonna post this video on um, our Facebook page, Canine Rehab Teaching Academy. So go there so you can leave comments. What do you guys do? How do you treat your avulsion, brachial plexus avulsion patients? What do you do for long-term patients over short-term patients? So let's start a discussion there because this is a community and we're all about sharing information. So I'm gonna post this video on the Facebook page and also in our closed group for our members Facebook page as well, so that they we can all start talking about this. Also, if you have questions, send them to support at veterinaryteachingacademy.com and I look forward to seeing you on the next video. Bye-bye.